Hey guys, welcome to Fringe FM, the show where we get the world's most interesting folks focused on today and the future. Today we've got Gad Sad on the program. Thanks for coming today, Gad. Oh, thank you for having me. Pleasure. So the first thing I want to jump into is, what's the biggest problem you see today in the world that's not getting talked about enough? Well, I don't know if it's not being talked about enough, but rather perhaps it's not being talked about properly. And I think that is the uh, the infinite ability of people to be parasitized by bad ideas. Uh, and this is really the point, I mean, not to plug my next book, but that's really the point of my next book, which is the idea that in the same way that organisms can be parasitized by actual parasites, and specifically uh, parasites that can go to your brain and cause you to behave maladaptively, I argue that there's a second class of parasites called idea pathogens that cause us to also behave maladaptively. And so uh, I think ultimately much of the calamities that we see in the world, other than the ones that are happening from you know, natural calamities, come from man-made problems. And these man-made problems come from us holding bad ideas. And so what I try to do in my next book is hopefully, well, first document the problem, but then offer ways by which we can inoculate ourselves against bad thinking. How do you think about bad ideas that are inherently obviously bad, like people believing in flat earth versus bad ideas that are societally accepted like religion? <laughs> well, that, that, that's a great question. So let me, let me give you a sense of the ones that I'm tackling in the book. Uh, so what I do is I follow very much the, the if you'd like, the approach of a uh, virus hunter, an epidemiologist who's looking first to see where the outbreak happened, right? Where is patient zero? and then how the virus spreads, and then how you could contain it. And so I argue that at least the bad ideas or the class of bad ideas that I'm interested in covering in this book really stem from the ecosystem called the university. Uh, you know, you, it really takes highly educated people for, to come up with really stupid ideas. And, uh, and so things like postmodernism, right? The idea that there are no absolute truths. We are all contextually bound by, by our relative you know, idiosyncratic biases. Well, that by definition is a form of intellectual terrorism, right? Because science does presume that there is a truth out there to be discovered. We may sometimes not do a good job at discovering it. We may think that we had a truth and then it's only provisional. Later, we revise our truth, but we certainly start off waking up in the morning thinking that there is a process by which we can try to better understand the world. Well, postmodernism says no. Uh, so that would be a bad idea that then has huge amounts of downstream bad effects. Uh, do you want me to talk about other ideas or do you want to jump in? Let, let's jump into some of the effects and then we'll jump into other ideas as well. Uh, so, well, you can end up then with a, a huge slew of discipline, quote disciplines, that are perfectly removed from any sense of reality, Right. Uh, as was recently uh, highlighted really well with the grievance studies uh, project. Are you familiar with that? Do you know what that is? I, I'm not. Can you quickly? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Reader. So, so, so the, the background is as follows. Uh, Alan Sokal, who is a physicist at uh, New York University, in 1996 uh, wrote a gibberish paper and sent it to one of the leading postmodernist journals. Uh, it was accepted, and then he said, oops, guess what? It was a hoax, right? Because he wanted to demonstrate that you can generate, you know, gibberish postmodernist postmodernist jargon that is completely bereft of meaning, but it can be lauded as, you know, wonderful academic insights. Well, now fast forward 22 years later, three people uh, decided to, if you, it's not colloquially called SoCal 2.0, decided to send 20 gibberish papers, not one, 20 papers to some of the leading journals in feminist theory and queer theory and critical race study and all the, the other rest of the nonsense. And seven of those papers were accepted in top journals before then, you know, it was found out that it was, you know, part of a project that they were doing. Well, now imagine that not only from a purity perspective, from an epistemological perspective, having these types of disciplines that are nothing but injuries to, to science, to reason, to reason, that's already problematic. But think about the opportunity cost of all the students over the past 40 or 50 years who have spent all of their time, if not their parents' tuition money, uh, attending these 
you know, complete bullshit fields rather than spending their time studying. Now, I don't mean to imply, by the way, that you can't study the humanities seriously or you can't study sociology seriously. Of course you can. Not everybody is going to become a neuroscientist and a biologist and a uh, psychologist, but you could still always ground it with a commitment to reason, to logic, and so on. And so at the very least, that already shows you that there are many, many generations of students that have been completely devastated by this garbage. I think the example brings up two problems. A, the example, it's obviously a problem with the theory itself of postmodernism. But the other example is confirmation bias. And I think that one's more prevalent in today's society. People believe something, so they find what they want to believe and accept that without question. What are your thoughts? So give me give me an example of how you're linking confirmation bias to postmodernism. Ed. So they they published uh, they tried to publish to twenty publications. The publications saw what they wanted to hear. They confirmed their biases and then published without really thinking. Oh well, right. I mean, it might be the case that uh, the fact that those papers were published is a manifestation of the confirmation bias. But I would actually argue there is a a more insidious explanation for it. When when your whole field is based on the random generation of gibberish, then anything goes, right? There is no framework by which I can judge something to be worthy of publishing or not, right? As a matter of fact, by the way, when SoCal announced that the paper was gibberish, you would have thought that this would be a devastating, you know, a, you know, that would be the death of the field. They just doubled down by simply saying, this proves nothing. As a matter of fact, we were able to extract meaning from your paper, even though you're saying that it's gibberish. So it's an infinite well of BS. So yes, perhaps in part there is confirmation bias, but I, I truly think that the, the epistemology of the field or lack thereof allows anything to be considered to be a worthy contribution. I'll just give you a very quick uh, other example of this. Uh, Postmodern art has a similar, uh, if you like, uh, lack of rules. You could take an empty canvas, and which was literally the case when I visited the Carnegie Museum in the, I think in 1996. Uh, you could take an empty canvas and you put it as part of your art collection. And as a matter of fact, when I saw that, when I was visiting the museum, I demanded to speak to the curator. They brought some assistant curator to see me who asked, how can I help you, sir? To which I said, what is this garbage? Why do you have an empty canvas? And of course, the answer was, well, isn't it beautiful, sir? This allows us to have an organic conversation about the piece, right? So when there are no rules, it's intellectual and aesthetic terrorism. Anything goes. Okay, I could I could see that. I want to I want to transition a little bit back to back to the confirmation bias, though, which I think is happening throughout society and is becoming we have filter bubbles, we have Facebook, we have the polarization of society. And I think it's a, it's a big problem. I wanted to, you to put on your, your research hat in terms of what you see and how you analyze the world as it is today and where we're headed. Uh, in which domain? Because it's such a broad question. Take, take, that, take that as you will, the one you find the most important. Uh, well, I'm, I'm someone who, who exists in the world of ideas. And so I am personally offended by what I call injuries to the truth. In other words, what gets me riled up, what gets me engaged in the public sphere is that I consider attacks on truth uh, to be truly injurious to sort of the pantheon of human knowledge. And so what I would love to see is for people, it doesn't matter if, for example, right now we're gonna have the, the, the midterm elections this is tonight in the US, I'm in Canada. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you're Republican or whether you're Democrat. As a matter of fact, I always say, I don't care. I'm Canadian. I don't have a dog in this fight. But what I would love for people to do is to at least arrive at their positions, whether it be in choosing a mate or choosing a car or choosing a political party, to arrive to a position uh, with well-disciplined thinking, right? Uh, and so the confirmation bias is an example of how people can have cognitive biases that distort their thinking. But there are many other such biases, right? So, for example, uh, since I inhabit the world of academia, I am uh, confronted with a lot more leftist lunacy than I am with right-wing lunacy. Not that right-wing lunacy doesn't exist, but the ecosystem that I inhabit exposes me a lot more to one type of lunacy than the other. Well, every single person in academia apes this sort of same song. 
if Donald Trump is going to win, you know, this is prior to him winning, you know, democracy is going to end. There's going to be a nuclear holocaust. Will, will he still make it legal for us to have sex or is he going to outlaw sex? There's going to be food shortages everywhere. I mean, I'm being a bit hyperbolic, but there is this kind of grotesque hyper reaction, right? And by the way, I'm seeing it now. If the if the blue wave doesn't materialize, it's the end of civilization. Well, this is not worthy of nuanced thinkers. Of course, there are reasons that you might be concerned if your preferred party doesn't win. But maybe we should respond in a way that is somewhat more rational. And so what I'd like to do, what worries me, what keeps me up at night is people's departure from reason. How do we build a society that's more built around reason? I feel like a lot of the structures we have were great in the past and we're evolving beyond today. Uh, well, I think there's sort of no magic bullet. It's really to develop what, you know, what I call a personal decision making hygiene, right? I mean, in the same way that if you, if you want to have good personal hygiene, you, you know, you take a shower, you, you do certain, you brush your teeth. Well, there is a certain set of steps that you should follow whenever you're tackling any issue, whenever you're taking a position. And I think before we started the show, I told you, you know, I believe in epistemic humility. If you're going to ask me a question uh, for which I don't have a good answer, I will simply say, you know, I really, I'm not, I'm not well equipped to answer that question. I don't know enough. And so uh, commit to evidence-based thinking, commit to the scientific method. Don't allow your emotional hysteria to guide your position. Now, I don't mean to imply, by the way, that emotions are not important decisions, right? It's not, you know, rationality or emotions. Emotions are not antithetical to rationality. But when we are on hyperactive emotional states, when we are engaging in what I call collective Munchausen, right? I'm a victim, I'm a victim. If Trump wins, is it going to be safe for the Jews? When you're engaging in this type of discourse and you're supposedly a professor, you've lost touch with reality. And so whatever the decision is, Commit to having good mental hygiene. How can we teach that to kids these days? Because they're growing up in a situation where we've designed the perfect factory for putting out factory workers that are mindless drones in an era where factories are going away. They need to find jobs and those jobs might not be there. The most critical skills, I think, are creative thinking, reasoning. How do we, how do we change the education system, especially earlier on, to make that more successful? Well, I mean, it, it, it's to teach them, as you said, how to engage in critical reasoning. But it, it's also about creating environments that promote intellectual diversity, right? Now, I, I understand that this, what I'm about to talk about is usually something that is that, that you feel more at the university level. But I think it's creeping its way, sort of this mono uh, monoculture of what is considered appropriate as a belief system is something that is terribly dangerous. And I'd love to use here an analogy. I, I wish it were me who had come up with it, but it's it, uh, the gentleman who came up with it is a neuropsychiatrist out of Australia. His name escapes me right now. Uh, it's a long sort of Polish sounding name. Uh, he basically argued the following. If you take, uh, and bear with me as I, as I set up the problem. Uh, in, in evolutionary medicine, you have the following situation. You, there's a, it's called the hygiene hypothesis. I was talking earlier about uh, hygiene. Uh, children who grow up in environments where there are a lot more pollutants end up suffering lesser from respiratory problems. In other words, it, 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 it triggers the proper immunological you know, defense systems. Your, your, your system needs to be exposed to pollutants. So he takes this idea, which incidentally, you know, I've talked about in my own work in evolutionary theory and so on, and then he brilliantly applies it, he analogizes to intellectual diversity. He says, look, if you grow up in a sterile intellectual environment where only one set of ideas, one set of beliefs are allowed, this doesn't allow your critical reasoning faculties to develop. You need to be exposed to opposing ideas for you to truly develop. And I thought that's just a brilliant way to analogize the mechanism, which, by the way, I'll be discussing this in my next book. Uh, and so this, to answer your question in a long-winded way, uh, allow children to develop the right set of skills that doesn't cause them to uh, you know, go into a corner and suck their thumb in a fetal position if they are exposed to ideas that are contrary to theirs. On the, on the contrary, 
they should have the right mental acuity to be able to process someone else's opposing positions and then argue their position. And we don't teach that. Why do you think in the U.S. there's essentially three topics that are are toxic? Religion, sex, and income or wealth. If you start those conversations, the at least in the U.S., become instantly polarized. Typically, typically politics gets pulled in with the, the wealth side of things. I was going to say politics as well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I, I'm not sure. I mean, is it do you, do you is your is it your contention that it's only in the U.S. because I could argue that those are the list on men, in many countries. No. I think it's way worse in the U.S. In Europe, they have much more civil conversations. They can talk about sex openly. They talk about politics openly. And in religion, it's much less extreme. I would say in the U.S., it seems to be the one of the more extreme, at least first world cultures. That I've, Obviously, there's some other cultures where those topics are even more taboo. But in the U.S., for a first world culture. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot. I mean, there's a lot to unpack there. So maybe I'll start with one. Uh, so in, in academia, there's this notion of forbidden knowledge. Uh, the idea that some some things are simply too contentious to study. If you if you want to be on the the right side of uh, or the correct side of the tracks when it comes to political correctness, don't study racial differences. Don't study sex differences. So maybe I'll answer it from from that perspective. So I'm someone who, of course, as an evolutionary psychologist, I I study sex differences. I recognize that uh, humans come as a sexually dimorphic species. There are innate biological sexes between the two sexes. Well, never mind that that is now considered Nazism. Uh, I mean, you're not even allowed to argue that there is such a, I mean, Harvard University has referred to this as, quote, fixed binaries and biological essentialism. So to argue that there is such a thing as male and female and there are evolved differences between the two sexes is one way of promulgating transphobia, okay? Uh, so I had to appear in the 21st century, a professor has to appear in front of the Canadian Senate, I'm talking about myself now, to actually argue in front of the senators that no, 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 there is such a thing as male and female, and there is such a thing as evolved sex differences. So again, I, I can't speak as to why the United States uh, may or may not have these taboos differently from others, but I just think that in general, the West is somehow sinking into an abyss of lunacy a departure from reason that again would not have existed where these ideas were not were they not promulgated at, in universities for the past 40 and 50 years so if you take postmodernism you take radical feminism you take cultural relativism cultural relativism basically says there are no absolute you know uh, universals human universals every culture is uniquely different well that's simply not true there is no culture where the frown that I'm doing right now is understood to mean a smile. There are innate facial grimaces that everybody understands, whether you are an Amazonian tribe or you are a Namibian peoples, right? Uh, and so all of these ideas end up parasitizing our brains so much that it becomes very difficult to have meaningful conversations. If you've ever meditated or just stopped to listen to yourself, you notice that most of the thoughts that come into your head seem to be negative and that's because your brain's designed to keep you alive do you think that's what's happening now is that life has gotten so easy that humanity has to find problems with itself that don't exist well i don't know about humanity i know certainly that you know we talk about the i think the term is first world problems right uh people people somehow need to construct a a narrative of victimhood hero's because, journey sorry hero's journey hero's journey exactly uh so uh, uh, so I don't know if your listeners know the, the, the affliction, the psychiatric affliction uh, called Munchausen syndrome, uh, which I've written about, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain in a second. Uh, I published a paper in a medical journal in 2010 on something called Munchausen syndrome by proxy. Let me first mention what Munchausen syndrome is. Munchausen syndrome is a psychiatric disorder whereby typically a mother, or, well, or typically a woman will uh, feign a, a, a medical illness so that she can garner empathy or sympathy. In other words, she gets her ego strokes by feigning that she is a victim. Munchausen syndrome by proxy is typically when you harm someone who is under your care so that you could then garner the empathy and sympathy by proxy. So for example, if you've got a biological child, you will harm the child 
because poor you, you are the mother of an ailing child, or you will harm your pet, or you will harm your elderly parent. Uh, now, I argue that, so, so to refer to your point about why do we create these problems, I think that the whole social justice warrior ethos, this is what I call collective Munchausen, and collective Munchausen by, by proxy, you, you, you pathologize all of these uh, uh, fake victimhood narratives because this becomes the currency by which you gain power, right? It, it, I, I, am, I am a victim, therefore I am. This is the only way for me to exist. Now, uh, I'm a very dangerous guy for the people who sort of engage in this type of collective Munchausen because I actually do have a personal history where I, uh, I actually went through an ordeal. I mean, I, I grew up in Lebanon. Civil war broke out in Lebanon. We're Lebanese Jews. We had to escape Lebanon under immediate threat of death. And so I do come from a culture where I truly had something to be fearful of. My parents were kidnapped by Fatah, a Palestinian group. Uh, they disappeared for several days before we were able to uh, find them and rescue them. And so when someone with my personal history comes to the forefront and says, listen, stop with the whining, appreciate what you have, then people uh, luckily at times will listen because it contextualizes their full victimhood in the context of someone who truly has suffered in his personal history. How do you think about suffering and how it defines people and how it defines society? I don't know about how it defines society, but I mean, uh, I, I don't know who said it, that li life is suffering. Is that is that Jordan Peterson or is there someone before him who said life is suffering? I think that was Buddha. Oh, that was Buddha. There you go. Thank you. Life oh, oh, my God. Jordan Peterson is going to be happy that I conflated him with the Buddha. Uh, he's but... got to put on a belly to get there. <laughs> well, especially now, he's lost a lot more weight. I think he's lost 50 pounds. Uh, maybe I need to go on that all, all meat diet that he's been on so I could lose those last pesky 40 pounds that I need to lose. Uh, but, anyways, uh, look, I mean, not to sound cliche ish, I think uh, we, we all experience suffering. It really is. Uh, how you handle the suffering that really defines you. Uh, so if I just describe, for example, a, a recent ordeal that I faced, uh, some people might think it's trivial, they shouldn't. Uh, we lost our, uh, our, our dog very, very suddenly, very quickly. And uh, there are very, very few uh, entities that I love more. I love my dog more than I love most of my extended family members. Uh, that was a very, very difficult uh, reality for me it was it was devastating uh, and at the moment when you're going through it you think this is it how, how, how am I going to get out of this every second I have all of these automatic reactions where if I get off my chair I, I do it in such a way that I don't step on her oh but she's no longer there when I go to the kitchen I expect her to be following me to get some morsel of food oh but she's no longer there and so for the first you know certainly for the first several weeks the pain is so intense you think that you're never going to come out of it come out of it, but then you persevere, you, you get your mind busy with other things. And then suddenly two months, two months later, I could be sitting with Matt talking about it, still feeling the pain, but suddenly I've come out of the abyss of darkness. So I think there is no magic pill. I think, uh, suffering is part of living and hopefully you can get out of it. That's it. Time heals most wounds. I want to, exactly. I want to transition now a little bit. So your background is consumerism, marketing, and looking at how consumers and society can be influenced. And I wanted to dive into that a little bit more. Talk sure. about how you got here, what your story is, and then we'll transition. Sure. So I, uh, I went to Cornell University. Uh, my background was in mathematics and computer science, my undergrad. Then I did an MBA where I studied marketing, and I also did a mini thesis in operations research, which is a applied mathematics field. So when I went to Cornell originally, it was to be a mathematical modeler. I was very much interested in studying consumer choice, consumer decision making, but from a mathematical perspective. Uh, uh, and then when I got there, uh, I connected with a psychologist, a mathematical and cognitive psychologist by the name of Jay Russo, who became my doctoral supervisor. And he suggested that I take an advanced social psychology course. This was in my first semester, 1990 at Cornell. And so I took a course with a gentleman by the name of uh, uh, Professor Dennis Regan. And about halfway through the course, uh, he assigned a book that would ultimately define my professional career. The book was titled Homicide. It was a book written 
by uh, two of the pioneers of evolutionary psychology, uh, Martin Daly and Marco Wilson. And they looked at patterns of criminality using an evolutionary lens. In other words, they demonstrated that there are certain you know, criminal phenomena that happen in exactly the same way, irrespective of time and place. And the reason why they happen in such uh, universal, universally recurring manners is because of certain biological mechanisms. When I saw the parsimony, the elegance, the, the theoretical coherence of how beautifully evolutionary theory was able to explain these, uh, these patterns, I had my epiphany. So since I was interested in studying consumer psychology, consumer behavior, I now decided that I would, you know, eventually, that's what I did, I would found the field of evolutionary consumption, which is applying biology to study consumer behavior. What are the evolutionary underpinnings that define our consumatory nature? And so that's been my trajectory. And over the past 25 years, uh, much of the research that I've done has been at the intersection of evolutionary psychology and consumer behavior. What are those principles that underline our consume our consuming behavior, and how do we change those going forward? Because if we continue at the rate that we're consuming, our landfills are getting filled quickly. Right. Well, well, I don't know. I mean, what? what so let me. I'll try to answer both questions. Uh, so I argue that there are four fundamental Darwinian modules that really drive much of our, uh, you know, consumer choices. There is a survival module, so that those that relates to phenomena that would have been adapted from a survival perspective, and then how do they manifest themselves today? So, for example, our evolved gustatory preference for high-calorie foods is why McDonald's is so successful in every country that it goes. Right? It's not because Justin Timberlake is singing a jingle. I mean, that helps. It helps it keep keep it helps keep McDonald's top of mind when I get my blood sugar level down and I'm hungry. But if McDonald's were selling uh, raw celery, it wouldn't do well. Therefore, it has to offer a product that is consistent with my evolved taste buds. So, so one set of consumatory choices fall under what I call the survival module. A second set fall under the reproductive module, things related to sex. So men and women will utilize sex-specific products as sexual signals in the mating market. So it's no coincidence that 99% of Ferrari owners are male, even though there are you know, many, many billionaire women and, and millionaire women, yet they don't line up to purchase fancy Aston Martins and Ferraris, right? Because that's a form of peacocking that is sex-specific. Women will use other products to, to ameliorate their lot in the mating market. Then the two other modules that I talk about are kin selection. So those are things that relate to how we met out investment to kin. And reciprocity is the fourth module that relates to why, how I, why would I be altruistic to Matt, who's, who's, who's not a kin? Why would I jump into a river to save somebody who is a stranger or even a friend who's not my biological kin? And so, for example, gift-giving practices that we see in consumer behavior uh, fall very nicely onto the kin and reciprocity module. So what I basically do is I look for evolutionary signatures that define our human nature, and then I demonstrate how they manifest themselves in the modern environment, in the modern consumatory environment. Now, to answer your question, how do we uh, stop these things? Uh, well, it's a difficult question because at any moment, we are there are multiple Darwinian uh, ropes that are pulling us in different directions, right? So for example, I may have the proclivity to uh, cheat on my monogamous union, on my marriage. Uh, both men and women have a desire to build monogamous unions, but also stray from those unions. Uh, but on the other hand, I also, have, I also have the evolved moral calculus that evolved that might temper me from doing so. So I'm not sure if there is a, an exact answer to how do we you know, help Mother Earth heal, uh, one of the ways that we can do that is by, uh, to use the argument of Peter Singer, uh, Singer the, or, or the terminology, uh, bringing in, you know, animal, our animal cousins into our moral circle, bringing in the landfill within our local circle, right? I think for most people, it's very easy to look at the African child who is suffering as someone far away over there. But if I can trigger my kin model, right? that he is actually part of my 
human tribe, or if I can convince people that that animal that you are so you know frivolously being cruel to is actually your evolutionary cousin. He's part of your tribe. So so there might be ways by which we can, if you like, tickle some of these Darwinian mechanisms to get people to be more caring towards our animal cousins, towards Earth, and so on. I think the clean meat movement is going to be very, very transformational very quickly. I'm very excited about that. But there's also the flip side of what you're discussing, and that's Facebook and Google and getting you to buy shit you don't need. How do you think about this data monopoly, privacy, consumption, et cetera, headed forward with some of these major issues we're facing? Uh, well, first, I'll talk about maybe the clean meat stuff. I, I don't know too much about it, but I certainly am someone who has struggled deeply with uh, the conundrum of being someone who is incredibly uh, committed to animal welfare. I, I just, I, I'm an animal lover. Like the thing that I most can't see, uh, and I usually, for example, when you know, you're watching one of those uh, shows and then a commercial with the animal cruelty comes on, uh, the whole family will rush to change the, this channel because we can't bear to see it. Yet on the other hand, of course, we do eat meat in my family. Uh, of course, the vegan folks will get very upset at me. They say, well, you're a hypocrite. How could you be such an animal welfare love, you know, supporter and engage in this? Well, the reality is it's, it's very difficult to conceive of a reality where everybody is going to suddenly become, you know, uh, to only eat uh, tofu and cereals, right? So in that sense, I see clean meat as a, as a wonderful uh, solution to, to that problem. Uh, by the way, the, the only time that I've ever had clips that I posted on my channel uh, that have received anything remotely as close as the number of dislikes as, as I did were when, was when the vegan, I call them the vegan rage brigade, came after me uh, because I had posted some stuff arguing that, look, it is part of our evolutionary history to actually be omnivorous. They did not like that. They were arguing that I was using science to justify something that is unconscionable. It's, so that, it's healthier too. It's healthier too. That's right. And, and I mean, there, I, I was, I was, I was uh, heartened in seeing a few vegans in the comment section saying, "Look, we're actually shooting ourselves in the foot here. Here is someone who should be an ally, right? I mean, and I am an ally. I, I, I think factory farm. I mean, there's, there's a tremendous number of ways that we can hopefully satiate our desire to eat animal protein without." condoning the unbelievably you know cruel practices of animal farming but it's but it's not an either or it's not a black or white so if you want to improve the welfare of animals surely there have to be some temperate solutions other than everybody on earth rejects animal proteins but this is and that's why they are a quasi religion right they they were absolutely unwielding in their position Short of my eating only tofu and bananas, I was a moral hypocrite who would be damned. And that's simply religious thinking, right? It's black or white. Uh, regarding what could you could you tell me again? What was the Facebook question? The, the data mining and so on. I mean, they are, they sold our democracy already, and they're selling all the other products as well. Are you worried about the power that these networks have to? Manipulate. Yeah. They they're they're hiring they're hiring guys like you to get a four year old to go and buy something on the mom's phone. Yeah, and, and you know, and I see this not only as a consumer psychologist, but I, I see it as someone who has young children. Uh, the allure of you know all these technologies. Uh, Richard Louvre, who's a best selling author, who's written about the need for children to interact with nature, has a wonderful term. Uh, and he calls it nature deficit disorder. The idea that you and I, and I'm, I'm obviously a bit older than you, but you know, we probably went out, a, def a definitional part of our being children was to be out. And actually, I, I get so excited when I see my children coming in and they have massive dirt under their fingernails. And then I look at their fingers and I go, that's how children's fingers should look like. You should be dirty, you should have dirt under your fingers, you interacted outside. Uh, but it's it's a tough challenge. I have to constantly get them to get off the couch, to get off of their video games and so on, to get out there. So it is a struggle. Uh, and I am worried about the amount of monopoly that these companies have, even from a very personal, selfish perspective. When I see the frivolity, the, how, how frivolous they are in, for example, demonetizing my YouTube videos, not, not that I make so much money off it. I, I don't. 
But just the fact that there is some person out there or some algorithm that can decide what Gatsad's content is worthy to be seen or monetized or not, uh, and, and, and how frivolous it is in the way. I mean, not a single one of my clips that I've ever done should be in the least bit dem demonetized, and yet probably about one third are. And so they do wield a tremendous amount of power. And so I wonder, maybe maybe you're you're better you're a better expert on this than I am, but I do wonder whether at some point the government won't step in and break these guys up. I, I don't know. What do you think? Do you think that that's something that should be should be happening? I think it should be. The big problem is the government is kind of in bed with the companies. They can go and say, we want the information on our citizens so we can survey them and not let them know we're spying completely. So I think there, I think there's a strange dynamic between the money and the information in power that makes it more complicated than you'd think. Also, what governor, what mayor, what president is going to get reelected when they did something and suddenly Amazon decided to bring their headquarters somewhere else? It's not going to happen because there's all the jobs and jobs are the only things that matter, of course. It's, so, uh, it's a conundrum. So I was going to say, so do you, do you think it's an intractable problem? So what, what, what's the solution? How do you see I, I think Europe is going to come after them with a knife. Europe is making up all of the rules that they want to and putting in all of these old fines. They're just kind of creating a law and then backdating it and finding the companies. I think GDPR and what they're doing, while right now when you go to a website, it basically says, click here to get rid of this annoying pop-up so that we can go back to the site. I think eventually these fines are going to start catching up with the companies. They're big fines. It's 4% of anything that Alphabet brings in worldwide. Not Google, not Google search business, Alphabet. Wow. It's uh, it's something. You, you're, you're, you're in the... You're in the you're in the technology space, right? Uh, very much so. Your, you're in your, that's your wheelhouse. Okay, right. Uh, here's a quick, maybe completely unrelated to anything we're talking about, but uh, how you could link some stuff from evolutionary psychology to technology. Uh, about ten years ago, I was invited to uh, Indiana University to speak. Uh, my first book had been released then, and so as is customary when you do these academic visits, you you go to different labs of different professors. And at one point, I had been invited to visit with the lab members of a social psychologist uh, at Indiana University. And at the time, they were doing a study on the size of, you know, friendship groups within Facebook. This is early on. This is 10, 11 years ago. And uh, so I, I paused. I had never looked at his data. Uh, I said, oh, do, do you have the data on the average size of, you know, how many friends people have? He says, yes, we do. To which I answered, and maybe you know the answer to this, you know, maybe you know where I'm going with this. I said, can I guess what it is? And he looked at me sort of perplexed. How, you know, how are you going to guess? How would you know this? I said, well, is it 150? To which he sort of looked at me uh, befuddled, thinking as if I were a prophet. Do you know how I knew that number? It's the, it's the amount of people you can keep in your head at once. There, look at you, Mr. Evolutionary Psychologist. Exactly. It's the Dunbar number, right? Uh, it's it's the fact that, uh, you know, we typically send no more than 150 Christmas cards. It's the reason why sort of the optimal size of a division in business is about 150, of a military organization is about 150. The average size of the number of guests we invite to weddings is roughly 150. So here is an example where a vestige from our ancestral environment manifested itself in a completely modern environment. Speaking of which, do we need to decentralize government and make it into smaller 150 person chunks? Uh, you mean, so get rid of a republic, you mean? Get rid of a federation, federal I system? Feel, I feel like you could have a federal system that was more decentralized. So smaller scale power that ultimately built, I mean, realistically for humanity to move forward. We need to get to something where we don't view this as the US and over the border as Canada and all of these different countries. We need to unify under a single civilization. But do you think decentralizing it, having smaller scale government would be beneficial for that, given the Dunbar problem? I mean, it, from, a, from an evolutionary perspective, in terms of what we're talking about, yes. Now, pragmatically, how easy it is to institute such uh, structures, I'm, I'm, it's simply out of my depth. I, I don't know. But certainly, whenever you have structures that are best aligned with human nature, you ultimately get the best outcomes. And the, the classic um, uh, quote that I like to use here is one from E.O. Wilson, the evolutionary biologist from Harvard, who is a entomologist. He studies social ants. 
social ants have a unique structure. There is one queen and then everybody else is equal. And so when he was asked about, so, you know, what do you think of communism and socialism? He answered one of my favorite quips of all time. He said, communism slash socialism, wonderful system, wrong species, right? So he's basically arguing that that particular, you know, socio-political economic system is great if it is consistent with the nature of that species. It's not consistent with humans because humans are hierarchical and they, they won't work well under such an environment. Uh, so to answer your question, uh, yes, in an ideal world, the, the, the more you can create governmental structures that are aligned with our human nature, uh, the more natural it will seem, the more effective it will be. Whether pragmatically you can do it or not is, is, is beyond me. I don't, I don't know if it can be done. Speaking of pragmatics, China has been doing a lot more than the U.S. lately. Thoughts? It seems to fit with that theory, although oh, disaligning a little bit between ants and humans. <laughs> do, doing what more recently? You said they're doing more recently. Of, of the, what? They're more effective at everything than the, at least the U.S. government. They're putting more money into all the technologies that matter. They're catching up quickly when it comes to AI, when it comes to solar, when it comes to autonomous vehicles, when it comes to city development, when it comes to transportation, every, every, uh, internet, everything. Right. They also steal a lot more stuff in terms mm -hmm. of industrial espionage. They also have worse human rights track records. So I'm not, I'm not advocating for them. I'm just merely bringing up the point that from a, from a structure perspective, it's at least working pretty well now for the vast majority. So it's interesting that you uh, mentioned about China back in 2013, when Justin Trudeau hadn't yet uh, become prime minister of Canada, but he was the leader of the Liberal Party. He was asked at a, a you know town hall meeting. I think it was a women's only town hall meeting. He was asked a, a softball question. You know, what is your which is your favorite country that you admire? other than Canada. And I found the exact quote. So he said, you know, there's a level of admiration I actually have for China because their basic dictatorship is allowing them to actually turn their economy around on a dime and say, we need to go green fastest. We need to start investing in solar. I mean, there is a flexibility that I know Stephen Harper must dream about of having a dictatorship that he can do everything he wanted that I find quite interesting. Uh, he got a lot of flack for that because basically he was saying, look, when you when you uh, exist in a dictatorship, you don't have to worry about multiple, uh, you know, conflicting voices. You do. You pivot as you please. So to go back to the point, I think, yes, China is catching up to us, but uh, life is a compensatory process for some of the good things they're doing. They do a lot of bad things. So I wouldn't seek to admire them too much. It is. And oftentimes in the long run. The best of intentions can bite you in the long run if you're doing them the wrong way. And I think China is doing it the wrong way. It'll ultimately have to make that transition. And if it doesn't, then we're going to have 1.3, 1.x billion people in, uh, in strife, so to speak. So we'll have to, see, we'll have to see how that plays out. I want to transition now. So you've built up a pretty sizable following. Why do you think that your, your words, your videos, your articles have had such a resounding impact and the same question to the the group the the intellectual dark web that you're a part of why do you think there's so much proliferation for this type of information so my feeling i mean i think there are several reasons but overwhelmingly i think we ultimately end up being the voice the mantle of the silent majority in other words i think many people support the positions that few of us are frankly, courageous enough to advocate because most people are terribly afraid of the thought police and uh, political correctness and so on. And so what ends up happening, I think, that the people that you mentioned who are part of this, uh, you know, collection of, uh, you know, this club are really intimating exactly what a lot of people are saying, but are afraid to, or are thinking, but are afraid to say. So I get tons of letters from uh, students, from parents of students, from fellow professors who say, thank you so much for speaking on my behalf. And so I think ultimately this is what's happening. Uh, people uh, want to hear what we're saying, but are too afraid to say it themselves. And I implore them, uh, if you follow me on, on my social media, one of the things that I often do is I say, you know, please get engaged. Don't diffuse the responsibility on a few people. 
And I'd like to think that more and more people are taking it upon themselves to get engaged, but it still remains a game of a few people, and that's truly regrettable. Do you think a big part of that is because mainstream media has failed so much? It's focused so primarily on advertising and eyeballs that it just becomes overly extreme? Uh, I mean, perhaps that. I also think that, uh, so to, to, to link what you just said to your previous question, I think one of the, some of the videos or clips that I've had the most success with are the ones that have been long format chats, not unlike the way you and I are, the one that you and I are holding right now. So you might think at first, oh, you know, people have short attention spans. They want a little nugget of three minutes because otherwise they're too antsy to sit there. Well, the reality is if you go to my channel and you look for the most popular videos, uh, it almost perfectly maps on the longest videos being the ones that are most popular. People really are hungry for meaningful, intimate, substantive chats. And uh, to the extent that I bring a lot of you know, fascinating guests on my show where we have you know, 75, 90 minutes of conversations, people really tune in. So, so I think what the mainstream media doesn't do to answer your second question is they don't offer such a forum. It's always in little nuggets of one, two minutes where you can't say much more than sort of soundbite platitudes. And people are frankly fed up with that. And that's why I think someone like Joe Rogan, who sort of is the king of the long format, right? I mean, you go on a show, it's three hours long. Well, this guy is pulling in viewing audience that's bigger than all of the mainstream media combined. Now, that's not a coincidence. That's because he really creates the type of environment where people feel they are truly participating in the process. And so, and so congrats to you for also engaging in these conversations because people are truly hungry for them. I think they are. It's the concept of email and letters. If you got an email today, there's a pretty good chance you got a hundred others. If I send you a letter, there's a pretty good chance you're going to see it because nothing is showing up. And I think a lot of that is the long form discussion, but it's, it's also the topics that we're talking about. You can't have a short discussion on that because when you do, it's an outrage machine. That's exactly right. Look, uh, uh, these outra outrage uh, triggers, if you'd like, are shortcuts, are heuristics for not thinking, right? I mean, I could either sit there and weigh all of the points that you're making. Some of the points I might disagree with, many of them I might agree with, or I could take a shortcut and just be outraged. So sort of this emotional triggering ends up being a form of heuristic processing. Uh, and that's truly regrettable. And that's what I was referring to earlier when you were saying, uh, you know, how could we teach our kids to there, there is no magic pill. You have to teach people to be committed to the scientific method, to critical thinking, to weigh the evidence. So one of the things that I talk about in uh, my forthcoming book is this idea of uh, building nomological networks of cumulative evidence. Uh, I know it's a, it's a mouthful, but this is an epistemological approach that basically says, look, if you want to demonstrate that some phenomenon is an adaptation, an evolutionary adaptation, then what would be the evidence that I would need to collect and present to you to show you, for example, that toy preferences uh, do have a biological uh, signature? In other words, toy preferences are not just due to social construction. Well, I could get you data that shows that even children who are not yet old enough to be socialized will prefer sex-specific toys. Boys will prefer trucks, girls will prefer preferred dolls. I could get you data from other species that shows that the infants of those species exhibit the same toy preferences. I could get you data from pediatric endocrinology where little girls who suffer from something called uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, which is a disorder that masculinizes little girls. Well, little girls who suffer from this disorder end up having a sex reversal of their toy preferences. So bit by bit, I can show you data coming from many different disciplines, many different fields, that when you put it all together, it becomes unassailable that my position is right. And so one of the things that I do in the book is to teach people to think in this manner, to think in this consilient way, to create unity of knowledge so that you could build good arguments rather than using nothing but, I'm offended by what you're saying as an argument. That's not an argument. So there you go. So it looks like we're gonna have to jump into this, and I wasn't sure if we were. You brought up something earlier and it, it goes or piggybacks off of this but the James Damore memo him getting fired having no chance in technology I'm thinking in terms of the the biological differences between men and women it's very obvious 
But I just remember maybe two, three weeks ago, I was watching a nature documentary with my wife and they're showing all of these different birds. And it's incredible. It, it's the birds of some Galapagos Island, et cetera. And they look beautiful, stunning, colorful, completely different, each and every one of them. And then you see the, the girl version and the girl version is generally the ugly bird because in the, in the animal kingdom, you have to attract a mate. And it seems like in all species we can talk about humans or not, there's more variation between the men than there are in the women. Is that not the basic argument of the science that people put forward and get crucified for? Yeah, so, uh, so I've spent many, many years uh, fighting against all of the emotional and cognitive obstacles that people levy at you uh, when they you know, they, they refuse to accept evolutionary psychology. And so I, I'll answer your question in sort of a, 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 a broad, long-winded way, if I may. Uh, a lot of evolutionary biologists, so these are trained evolutionists, are perfectly happy to use evolutionary theory to explain the evolution of sexual dimorphism, sex differences in these bird species that you're saying. But the second that you use the exact same principles to explain sex differences in humans, their heads explode. In other cases, you've got folks who are perfectly happy to use evolution to explain everything about us, why we have opposable thumbs, why our pancreas work the way they do, why every organ in our body works the way that it does, except I call it the stop at the neck bias. As long as you don't explain that organ, that defines your personhood called the human mind. Uh, so for all sorts of very interesting, although regrettable reasons, people have a, a inability to accept evolution if it somehow uh, seems as a attack on their favorite pet ideology. So for example, some evolutionary biologists hate evolutionary psychology because they were trained as Marxists. And somehow they believe that Marxism is inconsistent with evolutionary psychology. Radical feminists hate evolutionary psychology because they think that if you actually argue that there are innate sex differences, then this serves as father for maintaining the sexist status quo. Postmodernists hate evolutionary psychology because they argue that there are no universal truths, whereas evolutionary psychologists, of course, argue that there are human universals. So there's a long slew of utter morons who despise evolutionary psychology for every single wrong reason possible, but what they all have in common is that they reject evolutionary psychology because it attacks their pet ideology. And it really is a very difficult dragon to slay. I mean, I've had conversations with otherwise very sophisticated academics who simply cannot accept, they could not concede that biology could shape human behavior let alone that it could shape evolved sex differences. It's baffling. I mean, for me to go in front of the Senate to actually argue that there is such a thing as male and female in the 21st century, you would think it's a satire, but this is the reality we face. I think the problem is that people equate sameness with equality. And we fought this battle before. It was called communism. When people had to have the same of everything, you have the lowest common denominator for everyone. When you can acknowledge that people can have different, but equally awesome experiences, then you can have a situation where you have the Uber driver driving for six people and you don't need six cars. Is, it, <laughs> is that a comparable metaphor? Does that make sense? Yeah, I think you're exactly spot on. And I'll push, I'll push that uh, metaphor uh, or that comparison to the blank slate premise, which uh, the idea that the human mind is, you know, we're born tabula rasa and it's only socialization that makes us who we end up becoming. There is no such thing as biological imperatives. We're not born with any biological blueprints in our, in our minds, which is laughably false. And it speaks again to your point about equality. It, the blank slate premise is very hopeful because it basically says, don't worry, Matt and Gad could have been the top NBA superstars, just like Michael Jordan had, had it only been the case that their environments were conducive to them becoming NBA superstars. It's if, if there was only a way for us to retroactively social engineer their trajectories, they could have been the next Michael Jordan. Well, that seems very hopeful, right? Because that says that we all start with equal 
equal potentiality. So, so that, that equality argument is even more nefarious with the blank slate premise. We're all born equal with an equal chance of becoming the next great soccer player, the next Einstein, if only the environment would be conducive to that. So it's hopeful, but completely wrong. It is. From the science I see, I would say it's 50% genetics, 50% epigenetics. So how your environment affects the genes that you have going on inside your body. I think the nature and nurture argument has been pretty disproven at this point. And it's, it's funny that, well, it's not funny, but it, it's a fact that people don't like to necessarily talk about that. Yeah. And, and to, to, to add to what you're saying, the, 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 the metaphor that I use to exactly, I mean, what you said is correct about the nature nurture dichotomy being moot. I use what's called the cake metaphor. So if you take uh, the ingredients of a cake, uh, the eggs, the flour, the, the baking, you know, the powder, the, the butter, and you point to each of these ingredients before you bake the cake, you can exactly point to them. Now you bake the cake, the cake is finished. If I now ask you, please point to the eggs or please point to the sugar, you can't. It's an inextricable mix. It's a melange. Well, that's really what much of what we are. That's what we are. We are an inextricable mix of our nature and our nurture. And, and here I like to use a, I think the term, uh, a clever term, I think it was Matt Ridley, the evolutionary biologist out of England who came up with it. He had a book called uh, Nurture uh, or Nature, Nurture by Nature. In other words, Nurture is not antithetical to nature. Nurture exists in its form because of nature. So, for example, when, when people refer to socialization as an argument for who you are, well, socialization doesn't mysteriously come about. Socialization forces exist in their form because they support biological imperatives, not because they're contra biology. You follow? So, so you're exactly right. The whole dichotomy is utterly BS. How do we change that conversation going forward? Because we we recently discovered that that European American our European descent is more Neanderthal, and if that had gone the other way and a different race was more Neanderthal, we would have a lot of problems on our hands, both with w white supremacists and then with mainstream media. So how do we change the the the, the, the debate about nature, nurture, and so on? No, how Just... do we how do we make it okay to have facts? <laughs> Well, uh, it's funny. I, I was just writing today uh, a section in my forthcoming book where I'm discussing the the, the tension between uh, pursuing truth versus hurt feelings. In other words, what should be the driving motto, the, the, the driving raison d'etre of a university? And regrettably, uh, today, you always have to somehow bring into the calculus whether the particular thing that you are studying or espousing hurts someone's feelings. And so to answer your question, I think we have to return to uh, the central mission of intellectuals and then subsequently the people who consume that knowledge to strictly care about the veracity of the information. In other words, I pursue truth unencumbered by the constraints of it might hurt someone's feelings. Uh, for example, uh, it is absolutely true that epidemiologically speaking, young men are extraordinarily, ex extraordinarily more likely to be violent than elderly women. Yet no one would say, if I were to say, look, young men are much more dangerous than elderly women, no one would come and say, oh, but here you are being ageist or you are being sexist, right? People would accept that. But if I were to use the exact same argument for, you know, group X from religion X is much more likely to commit terror acts than group Y, suddenly you become a racist bigot. So there are certain types of information that somehow our thought police has deemed inappropriate to state. It is better to ignore that epidemiological data, lest you might hurt someone's feelings. But well, we have to return to an ethos where nothing is off the table. In a free society in the 21st century, never should we be quiet because it might hurt your feelings. Truth is the ultimate arbiter, and that's it. I would agree. I would say in almost all situations, there are some situations where it doesn't make sense to be entirely truthful, but those are more existential risk type situations. Like what? Can you give me some? Um... 
I imagine a lot of the stuff that's going on right now, let's say half, let's say 10% of what we see in the movies is remotely true. Would you want to know that a bomb almost went off in New York City and that the government prevented that from happening? Would you want to know that there was an asteroid that missed the Earth by uh, a hundredth of a degree? That's the kind of stuff where it's almost better having the ignorance. Oh, I see. So in this case, what you're basically saying is the government might have access to certain information that they choose not to divulge because they're trying to sort of reduce the level of panic in a society. Okay, I, I can buy that. But I guess my, my position was what is appropriate or not for me as an academic to either research, to share, and, and, and as you may or may not uh, realize, there's a lot of stuff that academics, if they choose to do research in a particular area, will get into hot waters. As a matter of fact, it's not that they'll get into hot waters if they do the research. If the conclusions of the research don't come out according to the politically correct narrative, then you you know you better shelf the research, right? So so if you conduct research looking at a sex difference in some uh, mental uh, ability te test, and it comes out that women are superior to men on that task, then you could, with complete safety, publish that research, and and that's great. If you were to conduct that research and it comes out that men are superior to women on that task. Well, you better get ready to receive a lot of hateful mail that you are a sexist bigot who is promulgating uh, tired, antiquated stereotypes. Well, that can't make sense, right? I mean, the veracity of a of research that is conducted through the scientific method should not be put through the prism or the sieve of some politically correct narrative. That right? That's that's social justice epistemology, as I call it. The veracity of that statement holds true whether it hurts your feelings or not. So we have to return to that kind of commitment toward truth. Does that make sense? That makes sense. They have a saying in a lot of fields, in science and politics, innovation happens when the old guard dies because you're able, you're able to get rid of those old biases. Is that the only way we can change? So that, that sounds like uh, Thomas Kuhn, right? Uh, if you, I don't know if you're familiar with him. He's a philosopher of science who basically argued that uh, when you have discontinuous innovations in science, uh, it's, you know, one of the ways you do that is you wait for the old guard to die out and then the new guard comes in. Uh, uh, I mean, regrettably, oftentimes that is the case uh, because what ends up happening is that the, as the old guard is on its last sort of defensive wall, they will go out kicking and screaming. And I'll, I'll give you a great personal anecdote of, uh, of that phenomenon. Uh, when my first book came out, I gave a talk at the University of Michigan. Actually, I gave two talks. I gave a talk in the psychology department, and then the next day I gave the same talk in the business school. Uh, I gave the, when I gave the talk in the psychology department, uh, everybody was like, this is, this is great. I mean, sure, of course, consumers are biological beings and studying the evolutionary forces that shape consumption. Yeah, great stuff, got out. The exact same talk when I gave it in the business school, I couldn't finish a single sentence. The hostility is the greatest amount of hostility I've ever faced in an academic talk. And, and the correlation between how hostile someone was in, the, uh, was in the audience was correlated to how senior they were in their academic ranking. The more senior they were, the more hostile they were. Well, why is that, right? Well, because they are vested in a particular paradigm that they feel is being threatened by biology boy coming on his you know, horse to Darwinize everything. Uh, and whereas the, say, doctoral students who are still shopping for their framework are much more likely to be open to a buffet of possible ideas, whereas the older guys were very dogmatic about, this is bullshit, what are you saying? Consumers are animals, are you saying they're driven by biology? This is nonsense, we're not mosquitoes, you're an idiot. So, and, and by the way, you also see that comparison when I would do a lot of talks in front of academics versus practitioners, I'd get a lot more hostility from academics. Practitioners don't have vested, you know, vested paradigms. They care about what works. So if I go in front of a bunch of executives and say, look, here are some evolutionary principles that you can use when trying to design optimal advertising messages. Well, they don't, they don't care about parad you know, paradigmatic walls. If it works, I buy into it. It's the academics who say, how dare you say biology matters? So you really see how ideology affects the purity of the academic process. 
And that becomes so much more amplified if you go to religion and take away someone's epilogue. So I, I wanna I wanna I know I wanna be respectful of your time, Gad. I've had you on here for a while. I have one last question for you, and that's if you had one thing to leave people with, a quote, a call to action, something of that nature, what would it be and why? Uh well it would be that don't sit idly, don't diffuse uh, the responsibility of engagement to a few folks that have to then carry the, the, the weight of everyone's expectations on their shoulders. Don't think that your voice doesn't matter. If everyone who has a very small voice speaks up in unison, it suddenly becomes a tsunami of a loud voice. And why? Because in the battle of ideas, uh, you need uh, battles to take place in the trenches, on, in Facebook posts, in the classroom, in, in, in the in the lunch uh, rooms of organizations, everywhere where there are ideas being discussed, you should be free in a free society to weigh in and not be silenced by political correctness concerns. And so I would implore people to get engaged in however big or however small way they can so that they can shift the, 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 the flow of the conversation so that we could return to societies where we are free to express ourselves without always being fearful that we're going to lose our jobs if we say the wrong things, as James Damore did. Because otherwise you're living in Soviet Russia. I think we, exactly. we've, exactly. All, we've all seen Inception. Ideas are, are viruses and they're incredibly powerful. And hopefully some of these ideas have shaken up the ideas in people's heads. Thanks for coming on today, Gad. Where's the best place for people to find you, learn more, and say hey? Uh, so uh, I have a, a YouTube channel called The Sad Truth, S-A-A-D, since that's that's my last name. So you can go check out The Sad Truth. I have, if you haven't watched it yet, there's something in the order of more than 750 clips for you to catch up. So it'll be a while before you get caught up. Uh, you can also follow me on uh, Twitter, at Gad, G-A-D, S-A-A-D. And I also have a public Facebook page that you can check out. Super helpful when you have a unique name. <laughs> That's right. Thanks for, thanks for coming on, and uh, thanks for tuning in, guys. Hopefully this has been fun. It's a little bit outside our normal wheelhouse, but I think it's, I think it's important looking at societal issues and how they affect us all going forward. Thanks, and thanks, Gad. Thank you so much, uh, Matt. Awesome. Right, nice.